Europa Clipper might be delayed. NASA is canceling its Viper lunar rover mission, mapping the dark matter in a dwarf galaxy, and a real life still suit. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. Europa is one of the most intriguing and compelling worlds in the solar system for us to visit. We know that there is like a rocky core surrounded by a fairly large liquid ocean of water. And that's surrounded by a shell of ice that could be tens of kilometers thick. And it's possible that there are geysers that are making this water go from below the surface through the ice and out into space. And so if we can just sample these geysers, get a much better sense of them, maybe that could tell us if there's life under the ice on Europa. And the scientific community is incredibly excited about exploring Europa. And there's the European Space Agency's JUICE mission is on its way to explore several of the Jovian moons. And NASA is working on its Europa Clipper mission, which is going to specifically be targeting Europa and make tons of observations. The plan for the Europa Clipper mission is that because it's such a high radiation environment around Jupiter, it's going to be making this really long eccentric orbit where it flies really close in the kind of danger zone, does a bunch of observations and then flies back out into safer, deeper space and then does it all over again. Unfortunately, it appears that some of the electronics on board Europa Clipper might not be able to handle the radiation of that close Jupiter flyby. So from NASA's perspective, when they put together the hardware for Europa Clipper, they went for the kinds of electronics that they thought met their specifications. But now third party testing has found that maybe it isn't going to meet that requirement, which means they might have to find a replacement. The problem is, is that the Europa Clipper is due for launch in October this year. And if it does launch, then it's going to take about six years to get out to Jupiter. It's going to use a couple of flybys to be able to shorten the duration of what it would take to be able to go into orbit around Jupiter. And so if there is a problem with these electronics and they need to find a new solution, something that is more hardened, the problem is they need to test out the electronics in the kind of environment that the Europa Clipper is going to be experiencing. So they're going to need to do multiple flybys, intense radiation, lower level radiations over time. And that's going to take a while. And so the possibility is that this could delay the launch of the Europa Clipper. Now, Jupiter isn't going anywhere. And so there's plenty of other launch windows that you could take. But the problem is the alignment of all of the planets that Europa Clipper is going to use to be able to get out to Jupiter to shorten that trip. And so it might be that not only it might launch a couple of years later, but then because you don't get those flybys, then the arrival is going to take even longer. So right now, we don't know how this is going to play out. And we haven't got any official announcement that they're pushing back the launch, only that they're concerned about these electronics and that there could be implications on the mission. The Viper rover is canceled. So on Wednesday, we got a big announcement from NASA that they were going to give a press conference to journalists and they were going to be talking about lunar science for the upcoming Artemis missions. So I thought what was going to happen was something to do with maybe Artemis three, where the astronauts are going to be landing on the moon. But no, in fact, we learned that NASA has decided to cancel their Viper mission. Viper stands for the Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover. This is a mission that was going to be part of the CLIPS program that was going to be delivering payloads to the surface of the moon. It's going to rove around on the surface of the moon, search for evidence of water as well as other volatiles mixed in with the lunar regolith. This is the kind of thing that then the astronauts could leverage when they actually arrive at the moon in 2026. And so this week we learned that NASA is canceling this mission. And it's kind of surprising because NASA has already invested hundreds of millions of dollars on this rover and it was already over budget. It was going to be probably even more over budget. And so at this point, NASA decided to just cancel the mission instead of letting its budget eat into other projects that it has priorities for. Here's one of the sad parts about this. NASA is still contracted for the mission that's going to go to the moon. They just aren't going to be providing the rover that the mission was going to be carrying. And so instead, they're going to provide a mass simulator test bed that will be carried on the spacecraft to go to the moon, but not the actual rover. The rover is built. The lander is going to be flying to the moon, but it won't be carrying the rover. I don't get it. Real life still suits. 
I hope you've watched the Dune series of movies and read the books. They're some of the best science fiction stories out there. And one of the really intriguing ideas in the Dune series is that there's these indigenous people that live on the planet Arrakis. And because water is so precious and scarce, they wear something called a still suit. And this is a way to recycle all of the water. It sounds kind of gross. These suits will harvest all of the sweat that comes off their body, all of the vapor that they breathe as well as their urine and then clean it up so that they can then drink it again. And so by doing this, they minimize the amount of water that they waste as they're walking around on the surface of Arrakis. Now, this is just science fiction, but engineers are working on a real life version of a still suit. When the astronauts return to the moon as part of the Artemis program or when they do really long EVAs when they're outside the International Space Station, they only have enough storage for a couple of liters of water. And so wouldn't it be cool if they could reuse the water that they're generating so that they could make it go a lot farther. And so this real life steel suit, it has a layer that absorbs the sweat on the body, they pee into it. And then of course, they're breathing inside their spacesuit. And then all of this water gets collected together, it gets cleaned by the suit and then is returned to the astronauts reservoirs for them to drink. According to their estimates, this can clean the water about 85% to make it potable again. As you can imagine, you've got two liters of water, then you get 85% of that and then you get 85% of that. And so that couple of liters of water would actually last the astronauts for much longer than if they had to just waste it. Who knows if this will actually turn into a full engineering prototype or get incorporated into spacesuits, or maybe we'll see some commercial version that you can wear when you go on a long, hot hike through the desert. But still, I love when science fiction ideas become reality. A Falcon 9 upper stage booster failed. SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket has been going for years and years. It's been a tremendous success. They've had 300 successful flights without a big problem. But last week they had a failure of an upper stage rocket. The Falcon 9 was carrying a bunch of Starlink satellites and the first stage booster launched it no problem. And then it separated. But on the second stage, it had an oxygen leak. And this led to what Elon Musk called a rapid unscheduled disassembly or a RUD. In other words, the rocket came apart. Now it was still able to release the Starlinks into orbit, but the problem is that they are too low to be able to fire their thrusters to be able to reach their final operating altitude. So they're all going to crash back in to the atmosphere in the coming weeks and months. The FAA has requested an investigation to find out what the problem is with the booster, whether it's going to happen again. And the problem is that SpaceX has about another 40 launches planned for this year. Most of them are going to be more Starlinks, but say at the end of July, we're supposed to see the launch of the Polaris Dawn mission. There's going to be a Crew Dragon mission launching to the International Space Station. So it could be that there's going to be a bunch of delays that's going to make it harder to be able to complete some of these closer missions. SpaceX shows off its deorbiting spacecraft. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about how SpaceX has won a contract to deorbit the International Space Station by 2030. And we weren't sure what this spacecraft was going to be. And I guessed some version of Crew Dragon and Anton, my producer, guessed Starship. And it looks like my guess was right. We got an artist illustration of what this thing is going to look like. It's a dragon with a fairly large service module with solar wings and just a lot of thrusters. According to SpaceX, this thing is going to have 30 Draco thrusters that are attached on the back, and that's going to give it six times the propellant of a normal Dragon capsule and four times the thrust. And so the plan is this will dock with the International Space Station onto one of the docking bays and then at the appointed time, it will fire those 30 engines and begin the process of deorbiting the International Space Station. Yeah, it's like a mini super heavy with 30 engines. I wonder how they're gonna make them all fit. It's crazy. Is flight five around the corner? So we still don't know when SpaceX is going to launch the Starship Super Heavy stack for the fifth time. The goal this time around is that the Super Heavy is going to do its boost back burn, return to the launch complex at Boca Chica and be caught 
by the Mechzilla chopsticks. And then in theory, it could then be launched again in the future, although probably not. This week, SpaceX shared a full duration static fire test. So this is like a test that shows that they can fire all of the engines on this super heavy booster for the length of time required. So all signs point to the next launch of Starship being just around the corner. All this talk about SpaceX. What about Blue Origin? What about New Glenn? Now, of course, this rocket company works in incredible secrecy. We don't see very much of what they're doing. We hear rumors. Who knows what they're doing? But this week, Blue Origin shared a video of the landing legs that are going to be on the New Glenn rocket. Unlike the Falcon 9, which has four landing legs, it looks like this one's going to have six landing legs. And that makes sense because the New Glenn is going to be a wider rocket than Falcon 9. It's also going to be landing on a drone ship in the middle of the ocean, so it needs a fairly solid platform to be able to land. So it was great to see the landing legs. Let's see the rocket now. And then let's see it get tested. Every week we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the best story of the week. And this week, the big news was this moss that was discovered that could help terraform Mars. It was pretty overwhelming. So thank you everybody who voted on the poll. Now within 24 hours of this video, we'll put the new poll up for you can tell us which of these stories you thought was the best. Put that into the community tab. But if you're just scrolling on YouTube, it should show up and you can just vote for the story that you thought was the best. Of course, the best chance, subscribe to our channel, watch a bunch of our videos, train the algorithm to show these votes to you. Why the Great Red Spot is shrinking. Astronomers have been watching the Great Red Spot on Jupiter for hundreds of years. This is a gigantic anticyclonic storm that is just a permanent fixture on the surface of Jupiter. In fact, you can see it with a small telescope. And back in the 1880s, the Great Red Spot measured about 40,000 kilometers across, much bigger than the Earth. And now the Great Red Spot has shrunk down to about 16,000 kilometers across. So it's dramatically smaller than it was. In fact, when the Voyagers passed by, it was bigger then. And so clearly the Great Red Spot is shrinking in fairly rapid time. But why? So researchers built a model where they watched how various storms were interacting with the Great Red Spot. And they found that as long as enough storms are being absorbed by the Great Red Spot, they found that it was able to then maintain its size or even grow. And so based on those calculations, there's not enough storms being fed into the Great Red Spot for it to maintain its size. The Great Red Spot is starving. Mapping the dark matter in a dwarf galaxy. Astronomers still kind of have no idea what dark matter is, but they're able to map its location and concentrations with ever greater precision. And so recently, astronomers used observations from the Hubble Space Telescope on a nearby dwarf galaxy called the Draco Dwarf Galaxy, which is located about 250,000 light years away. Because the galaxy is relatively close, the Hubble Space Telescope was able to pick out the individual stars in the galaxy, and then astronomers were able to measure the radial velocity velocity of those stars. Are they moving towards us away from us compared to the overall motion of the galaxy itself? And from that they were able to measure how the dark matter is interacting with the galaxy. And what they found is that the dark matter is concentrating down into the core of the galaxy, which is what the current models of dark matter would predict. I'm going to share a video that my wife took just this weekend showing a school of fish moving past a shoreline. And so even if you didn't know that the shoreline was there, you could see how the fish are changing their direction as they move past the shoreline. The part that we didn't get on camera was that larger fish were moving just below the school of fish and they were separating away. We couldn't see the fish, but we could see the presence of the fish because of how the fish were moving away from, I guess, a predator. And so it's the same thing, but instead of fish, imagine stars. And instead of predators, imagine blobs of dark matter. I, I hope the analogy works. Yeah, instead of them being going away, imagine them being attracted. Anyway, cool fish video that we shared and cool discovery with the Hubble Space Telescope. Webb completes its second year with a bunch of news. I know it's hard to believe, but we've just wrapped up the second year of science coming from the James Webb Space Telescope. And to celebrate this second year, folks working with Webb released a really cool new image. Its official title is ARP 142, and it is a 
galaxy collision located about 326 million light years away. And you've got two galaxies, one which is known as the penguin, although I think it looks like a hummingbird is a mangled spiral galaxy. And then the other one that you see in the scene that's known as the egg, and it is an elliptical galaxy and the two galaxies are in the process of merging, they've already done one flyby, and that caused these distortions to the penguin. And that flyby started about 75 million years ago. And then they're going to continue more of these flybys into the future. And eventually they'll merge into a much larger elliptical galaxy. Cool picture. And of course, with Webb, with the infrared, you can see the gas, the dust, you can see how all of this interaction is causing new star formation in the penguin galaxy. And it's like a hint of what's going to happen with the Milky Way when we merge with Andromeda in the far, far future. It's going to be like a renaissance in star formation in both of our galaxies before they end up merging become one giant elliptical ball and then run out of star forming regions and then just cool down become a reddened elliptical galaxy. In other news, Webb analyzed the atmosphere of a tidally locked hot Jupiter planet known as WASP 39b. What's important about WASP 39b is that it is tidally locked to its star. So it's always showing one face to the star and one face is away from the star. And Webb was able to detect a difference in the temperature between the eternal morning on one side of the planet and the eternal evening on the other side of the planet. It found it was about 200 degrees cooler on the morning side of the planet than on the evening side. So cool that it can measure that level of weather on an exoplanet. And then Webb measured the weather on the closest known brown dwarf. This is known as WISE 1049 AB. In fact, it's AB because it's a pair of binary stars that are orbiting around one another, but together they're about six light years away from the Earth. And Webb was able to make observations of the atmosphere of this brown dwarf so that scientists could produce 3D models showing what the weather looks like on the surface. And of course, brown dwarfs, these are this connection between larger stars or giant planets like Jupiter, this will allow astronomers to be able to understand how they work better. Now I mentioned this is James Webb's second year of images. Now we made an amazing video a year ago for all of the stuff that was discovered in the first year with James Webb. Well, we've done it again, we've made a video about the second year of James Webb's scientific discoveries, all of the major images, science discoveries that you're going to want to know about. And that's going to be dropping on our channel in just a couple of days. So stay tuned for that. With so much rocket news this week, I want to talk about like some of my impressions about the launch market in general. But first I want to share a video of a family of otters that my wife captured when we were out on that same walk, we were looking for the fish. There's like seven baby otters following the mother into the ocean. Next, I want to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Adam Schaefer, Andrew M. Gross, Bill, David Giltonen, David Matz, Dennis Alberti, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Modzo, Paul Rohrbach, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Fowler Munley, and Vlad Shiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. It's a very strange time in space exploration and rocketry. And I haven't seen this time at any other point in like the 25 years that I've been doing this job, where there are many different competing rockets that are coming to market all at the same time. And yet we don't know how this is all going to play out. Very successful rockets like the Falcon 9. But then we've got all of the other major launch providers, United Launch Alliance, they've gone to their Vulcan rocket, Ariane just switched to their Ariane 6 rocket, we've got the space launch system that's just had only one test, that's going to be the thing that's going to be carrying astronauts to the surface of the moon. And of course, we've got SpaceX testing their Starship. And we don't know how this is all going to play out. It could be that Starship works great and they're going to run away with the entire launch market. It might turn out that having Starship survive reentry is more technically challenging than anybody was ever prepared for. It might be that the space launch system is going to be too expensive to maintain on a long term basis. It might be that the Vulcan rocket isn't competitive to offerings from other suppliers. It might be that New Glenn is going to work perfectly on the first time and we're going to see a real solid competitor to SpaceX. But then how's that going to be replaced? And what are the Chinese do? Anyway, I am I'm not freaking out, but I'm definitely watching all of this with great interest. And I think 
in the next couple of years, things will settle down and we'll have a much better sense on where all of this is going. But until then, it sure is exciting times. All right, we'll see you next week.